welcome everyone to today's Circular Coffee and Conversation with me, uh, Erica and Sophie, who run the Circular Economy Club based in Reading. Uh, this was an initiative that kicked off in one of the lockdowns to really keep the, uh, keep the community alive and actually grow it at the same time, but also profile local and wider businesses in the area doing circular economy businesses, campaigns, organisations, lots of that. At the moment, actually, uh, we're focused around food, packaging, uh, drinks as well, uh, around that as well. Um, the way it works, first of all, we'll have, um, Sophie will be chatting to Emily for about 15 minutes or so. Um, all of you in the room, our live audience, uh, can log questions in the chat as we go. Also, feel free to share your LinkedIn's, um, anything else in there that, that you think of. And then we'll have about 10, 15 minutes at the end to kind of go through some of those questions also to yourself. So I'll hand over to Sophie now. Here we go. So hi everyone, welcome Emily again. Um, so we always start those conversations by asking our guests uh, to bring what we call a circular, co a circular conversation starter. So we were wondering, what did you bring us today? Do you have something for it? Yeah, yeah. so uh, actually I brought, uh, so it's, uh, uh, plastic made bag, uh, which I actually have in my pocket uh, all the time. And so when, uh, so I used to go to the supermarket and like all of us uh, take the, the kind of, uh, single use plastic bags. And then I thought, okay, I need to switch to a tote, pa tote bag because that's a lot more eco-friendly. The problem with a tote bag is that it's actually quite bulky and uh, so I used to uh, sometimes forget uh, the bag and it uh, made me feel uh, really guilty. So, uh, uh, so one day I went to uh, a local shop uh, um, uh, and actually found this, uh, this kind of reusable plastic bag. And that's something that now I've been using for uh, over two years. So it's extremely durable. It's uh, kind of... Uh, plastic mixed cloth, so that means I can wash it easily um, and uh, it takes uh, no space at all. So it fits really well into just uh, a pocket of my uh, jacket. So I, I thought uh, uh, that's, that's obviously uh, still plastic, but for me it's worked uh, much better than having uh, thousands of tote bags that I actually don't use. Yeah, it's really interesting. I love what you're saying as well, because it's all about the convenience aspect. You know, it's like, it's not just making transit, but it needs to be convenient for us to, to make the switch, isn't so. And I forgot to say, you're all in with a treat today with all of our French accents. <laughs> <It's new. Yeah. laughs> okay, fantastic. Thanks for that. So um, I was thinking, you know, to get started, maybe could you tell us a, a bit more about, I guess, your story and how you really started fighting food waste, I would say. Yeah. So my, my background is not at all in food. So my background is actually in, uh, in finance and I work for uh, a few uh, big corporates. And then actually I wanted to, I've always done quite a lot of charity work, but that was on the side. And I wanted to move to doing something more purpose, purposeful and, uh, and meaningful. And so I moved to the charity sector and worked for an international NGO uh, focusing on helping um, empowerment and development of adolescent girls in developing countries. And uh, that was kind of that first step towards uh, doing something with more purpose. Um, but I kind of found that in the charity sector, there's, it's still very much driven by uh, the need to raise uh, funds um, because a charity relies either on uh, public donation or on corporate fundraising or kind of, uh, getting funding from uh, international institutions. And therefore the agenda was very much driven by the agenda of these big uh, corporations or big uh, institutions. And so there, there was kind of, plus the fact that my background is in finance, there was always a bit of frustration of uh, why can't uh, actually uh, profit and purpose uh, coexist and, uh, and Actually, there's value in people paying for something because that means so there's true value uh, which shows when people are ready to pay for something. And the, uh, the idea for Hotbox uh, came from a few different things. 
So uh, as Sophie mentioned, uh, I, I, as you can hear, I'm originally from France. So I grew up in the north of France uh, in the countryside. My grandparents were actually potato farmers. Uh, and we've always had a huge, uh, a huge uh, kind of garden, a huge veg plot where we, we would grow uh, our own produce, lots of fruit trees and uh, um, berry bushes. So kind of very much uh, eating in season and connected to how produce was grown. And I then went to work for a few years in India where, again, uh, eat, people eat very seasonally because the storage facilities are, um, are less available than they are here in developed, in developed countries. And when I came to the UK, I was quite fascinated by the fact that you can find everything all year round. So you find strawberries all year round, and that's quite amazing because then uh, you don't need to think about adapting your recipes uh, based on the season. But I was also quite frustrated by the fact that it actually doesn't taste of anything to eat strawberries in the winter. And that uh, there's quite a lot of value in knowing what in season and eating with the season. And uh, at the same time, there was a campaign by uh, you, Fermi Whitting Stall, around the war on waste. And there was a campaign by a French supermarket around uh, ugly fruit and veg. And I thought that I, I'd love to kind of support these kind of initiatives and eat more seasonally and eat produce which are at risk of going to waste. And I couldn't find something similar. Though I found two uh, startups in the US which started something really similar to Oddbox. And so I thought, uh, maybe that's, <laughs> that's kind of an idea. And like uh, maybe uh, uh, many of you, uh, I thought uh, uh, it would be uh, at some point I'd like to start my own business, uh, do something uh, on my own. And so Oddbox really started from that, um, thinking that's a great concept that these two startups have in the US. Maybe it can work in the UK. And so when we started Oddbox, um, I was still working uh, full time. Uh, as uh, director of finance uh, for the, uh, that uh, international NGO. And uh, so it started at the weekend. We found a few uh, suppliers at the wholesale market, uh, so at the New Covent Garden market in London. And uh, um, and uh, kind of, so it, it wasn't very easy to convince them to, uh, to work with us because, first of all, uh, we didn't know much about the sector. We uh, didn't want uh, big quantities. Uh, and um, so, but we've, we were able to convince uh, two wholesalers. And so we would go to the market on uh, Friday, uh, Friday overnight or Saturday at uh, four or five in the morning, uh, get the produce, pack the boxes and deliver these few boxes. So we uh, initially we did a small trial. So we thought, okay, let's do a few weeks trials. We printed a few leaflets that we distributed in our neighborhood. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Uh, a few people thought we were uh, a legit company and kind of signed up for, to, uh, so at the time we were call, not called Oddbox, odd um, we were called uh, uh, Tasty Misfits, and so signed up to uh, Tasty Misfits, and uh, that's how uh, so we had only 20 customers, half of them were actually friends or people we knew, and half were proper customers, just to test whether it could actually work, and, and whether uh, the... Uh, people enjoyed uh, getting different types of produce and for us uh, to know how we could manage the logistics. So it was very much packing and delivering the boxes ourselves, dealing with the customer service. We built uh, a small website uh, with some of the shelf solution uh, just very quickly. So it, and we didn't have printed boxes. So it was just cardboard boxes where we would uh, write the names and the type of uh, box. So very much kind of, uh, uh, con testing the concept uh, to see whether there, there was some potential or not. And at that time, we actually didn't have uh, kind of a big vision uh, for what we, it would be. We never thought about uh, raising investment. Uh, so it was, uh, uh, it was just a side project. That's, that's fantastic. You know, it really sure. I, it always amazes me when you see <laughs> this entrepreneurial journey because it, it is a journey. It isn't like a black of white, but it is a journey. And I also love what you were saying. When you start growing your vegetables, you do realize that nothing looks in perfect shape, basically. <laughs> I don't really know how we can do that. 
Um, and I guess that probably links to my next question that is maybe more linked to the pandemic because a lot of people, you know, have started growing more their own veg, having this realization moments that actually not everything is perfect. There's a lot of food waste, but also bringing back a bit more local in that respect. Um, and I know that you've got a really interesting story there as well, because you're working both with restaurants, but also with individuals and, and people. So I guess I'm quite curious to see, you know, really what has, have you seen as the impact of the pandemic, you know, on your business, but also on the, the behaviours from the people in regards to food waste? Yeah, and, and maybe I'll just kind of, uh, for people who don't know what Oddbox is, just explain uh, what the concept behind Oddbox. So we're a sustainable fruit and veg box. Uh, tackling food waste. So uh, we work closely with uh, farmers and we rescue fresh seasonal surplus and odd fruit and veg which are at risk of uh, becoming food waste. And so uh, there's uh, several reasons why uh, fruit and veg are at risk of becoming waste. So uh, it's just that uh, uh, the supermarkets have specification in terms of how uh, the fruit and veg needs to look like. So in terms of size, shape, mostly size and shape, uh, because it needs to fit in the right packaging. Uh, also colors, cosmetic imperfections. So if it's got blemish, small kind of cosmetic blemishes, they might not necessarily uh, take the produce. Or a lot of it is uh, because it's surplus. So there's uh, as much as the growers try to forecast the weather, there's still a lot of unpredictability. And sometimes the crop will come early or will come late, or there's overlap between seasons, between the UK and produce coming from abroad. So there's a lot of, or, or sometimes uh, it's, there's a cold uh, sprint and uh, people don't feel like eating lettuce and they just want to eat root veg. So it's very much kind of influenced both by uh, um, uh, issues on the supply side as well as on, on the demand side. And so, um, because we're a veg box model, people don't choose what goes in their boxes and uh, we compose the box uh, based on what needs to be rescued. Obviously taking into consideration that nobody wants a box uh, full of potatoes, but uh, it's very much uh, still kind of seasonal. And right now that means it's a lot of uh, cabbages, a lot of root veg, a lot of apples, uh, some citrus uh, coming from uh, from uh, uh, Spain or Italy, so it's uh, it's still kind of very much seasonal. And so what we've seen, so obviously with the pandemic and people uh, being more at home, we've seen seen a huge increase in the demand for hot box uh, because uh, it's a convenient way of not having to go and shop at the supermarket and to get produce delivered directly to your door. But we've also seen that. Uh, Actually, kind of, especially at the start of the pandemic, because there was such a frenzy to uh, have uh, food at home, people value pro kind of food a lot more. So there was a bit of a shift of, uh, um, we've had several years where everything was easily available. Suddenly, we were in that warm mindset of, uh, I can't access food. And then kind of that shift in, uh, actually, uh, food is, is so valuable and it's a necessity. So I think there was a huge mindset uh, from people on, on that. Uh, a mindset of, uh, I want to support my community. There's uh, uh, people in difficult situations around me um, and, uh, and supporting local cafes, supporting local businesses. So very much kind of that uh, um, wanting to do something for the local community. And that's meant kind of really reconnecting with uh, how food is grown with, and a lot of people also kind of uh, basically at home doing a lot more home cooking. So uh, a lot less uh, takeaways um, or kind of getting from small cafes and restaurants, so a lot more focus on cooking from scratch. And actually in terms of, so in terms of big trend, so, uh, the uh, grocery shopping, so online uh, grocery shopping was 7% of the overall grocery shopping pre-COVID. It's now uh, almost double of that. So it's, uh, it's now around 12% of overall grocery shopping. And so it took 23 years to reach 7%. Uh, it took uh, less than a few months to, uh, to double. 
that shows kind of the massive shift from uh, people going to the shop uh, to people getting things delivered uh, to their door. And that's fascinating. I remember because we had to go in self-isolation just before it all started the first time around. And we have basically literally spent 14 days without shopping delivery. But it shows how much we've got in the house. And when I got my first box of bed, I was like, oh, I nearly had a little tear. You know, I was like, they're all wonderful and beautiful. But it really makes you, as you say, value the, the small things, the things that we take for granted, I think. That's really interesting. I'm also curious about the, the upstream side, so all the supplier side. Um, and there's quite a lot of discussion on this one around, you know, like regenerative farming and you know, all the different aspects about the food system and how we almost need to reshape that. I was wondering about, you know, what's your view on that and some of the key trends and things that we probably need to do. And if you've got anything linked to the pandemic as well, um, you know, how you've managed to reach them and deal with Brexit at the same time and all of that <laughs> would be amazing. Yeah, so, I, I, so uh, obviously there's a lot more focus and understanding of the issue of climate change, and uh, uh, and that's why there's uh, and and that's why there's more focus on uh, new ways of farming. So whether it's uh, um, hydroponic farming, so that means kind of farming uh, outside of uh, of the soil. So kind of, um, uh, and that that uh, uses a lot less. Uh, energy, a lot less water, and that's a lot more predictable. So there's a lot of development on uh, in hydroponic farming, but, uh, and uh, obviously food waste is a massive issue. So on average, 30% of all the food we produce globally is thrown away and never consumed. And uh, um, and food waste is one of the main uh, contributors to climate change because it's a lot of resources which go into growing the food we produce, which then uh, is wasted. And I'll give you kind of, so um, in terms of big stats, if food waste was a country, it would be the third largest contributor to greenhouse gases after the US and China. Um, so basically by solving the issue of food waste, we can uh, contribute massively to solving the issue of climate change, but just more kind of, on an individual basis, uh, it takes um, 100 liters of water to grow one banana. And so throwing uh, 100 liters of water is uh, roughly the equivalent of taking a shower. So uh, you can choose not to take a shower or you can choose not to waste the bananas which have been grown. So I, it's kind of, uh, I like to give that example because it gives a bit of context to uh, the choices that people can make uh, in terms of being more sustainable. That's why for us, uh, we, there's, and obviously the food waste is not the only issue. There's a lot of issues which need to be solved around uh, kind of better farming, around climate change. But we felt uh, actually food waste is probably uh, the most commonsensical or the easiest way to address it. Uh, uh, without uh, too much resources, too much investment, and that everybody can uh, can contribute to. It's fascinating. It's brilliant to put those numbers in perspective because all of a sudden you're like, oh, now I can see. You know, it's not just a big number, but it, it does make sense in that sense. Cool. Um, so I'm getting to the end of the question that I'm having for Emily. So if any of you have got any, please put them in the chat. Um, we can do that because I think, yeah. Time always flies, that's a challenge <laughs> that we've got. Um, just one qu more question, Emily. So we always ask our guests actually to, you know, point us towards another person, or organization or topic, basically, um, that we could um, bring in for the, the next conversation. Do you have anyone in mind? So uh, in the food waste space, there are several people who uh, can uh, do something good around food waste. So we partner quite a lot with uh, uh, toast, which use bread to make beer. And actually, uh, they've, they've, they are doing, they are partnering with several other companies and they've, uh, uh, every month they are launching a new beer. And uh, uh, in the next few months, there's going to be a collaboration of uh, toast and hot box, so a special beer made with uh, rescued uh, fruits. Uh, but they've been doing a beer with uh, uh, divine chocolate the chocolate-based beer, and uh, so they've got quite a lot of, uh, uh, so that's, that's a good one. We also work closely with ru Rubies in the Rubble, uh, who make uh, chutneys and plant-based uh, mayos made from uh, 
uh, from aquafaba, which is the water of the chickpeas. And then there's uh, several other plants. So up circle, uh, which does uh, um, kind of, uh, creams made from, uh, or coffee scrubs made from um, you know, uh, coffee, unused uh, coffee. Yeah, that's fantastic. So it's, it's brilliant you're mentioning Tosco. They're actually coming to join us end of March. Um, and uh, and we were, I didn't know that actually you were doing that joint uh, partnership in March. So, and he's very kindly given us, us all um, a discount basically. And we're doing that circular coffee in the evening. So it's going to be a circular beer conversation. We decided nice. to test <laughs> at Oddbox Toast beer at the time. So that'd be fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Emily. Erika, I'll pass it on to you to see if there are any questions from the audience. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And, and I love the, all these different organisations that work around circular economy and food waste, collaborating and sharing and, and taking stuff forward, much more agile sometimes than, than some of the bigger, <laughs> bigger organisations out there as well. Um, does anyone have any questions in the audience? We had um, a comment or a question on seasonality um before ah we've got one, one from paul about um do you face any problems with with some of the surplus produce you've you've you know you've brought in that maybe it is a touch too far or customers complain or or other elements around it and, and how do you how do you handle some of those kind of issues so repeat, repeat again erica the question yes so one question was about I suppose sometimes you might buy in the surplus expecting it's still going to be of a kind of a certain yeah. quality, yeah. but it might actually be a touch too far for, for people in their boxes. Yeah, so actually we work quite closely with our grower and now we work with close to 100 different growers to, uh, because we are not able to take everything because uh, we need to make sure that it still has a good life. Uh, so that it can be in our boxes and in it can be consumed and not uh, wasted uh, in uh, people's homes. So it's quite important that we make sure that uh, it's perfectly good quality. So there's a lot of work up, uh, upstream with our growers uh, to agree uh, quality standards. So not look standards, but quality standards. Um, however, in some cases, we also do a lot of grading when we put the produce, so when we receive the produce and when, when we put the produce uh, in the boxes, um, because it's fresh produce, uh, it degrades over time and uh, there's, there's always going to be uh, some uh, things which uh, we'll notice a bit later. And uh, in terms of our, so we don't waste anything ourselves. Uh, and that was something that we addressed from very early on. So either it's, uh, uh, so we, we've partnered from very early on with City Harvest and then the Felix Foundation that any surplus that we have, um, we donate it to them. And actually we don't think about them as uh, charity partners. We just think about them as partners because the alternative for us would be to uh, pay um, kind of a, a food waste, uh, uh, somebody would collect our food waste and uh, uh, and send it to uh, anaerobic plants and anything which isn't good enough to donate to our par partners will go to uh, an uh, anaerobic digestion plant basically which will make energy from the food. Brilliant. I like that kind of way that you've looked at it at every different level there. Um, I'm just looking at the time now and we'll probably have to wrap up, but I'd like to say a huge thank you, Emily, for joining us and sharing your story. I love the beginning story as well around how you started and you just tried it locally, this kind of test and prototype and get real feedback and, and if it works. And I think that will inspire. I work with young people as well. And, and you know, how do you solve problems? Just, just try it and see see what feedback you get. I think that's really inspiring as well. Um, just to all the others on the call, a few little uh, notes. As um, Sophie mentioned, and I think it's really nice to have that toast ale collaboration that we know, um, the next few sessions again are on food waste. We've got plastic free Cavisham um, joining us. Actually, the next one is Ground Delivery, which is a new startup in Reading, uh, doing delivering unpackaged goods like um, nuts, coffee, other types of items to your door as well. So that's, I think, one started during the pandemic. 
Then we've got plastic free Caversham talking about community as well as local council uh, role towards um, packaging and plastics around that as well. Uh, Part of the surface against sewage initiative and then we've got that evening session with toast ale as well so um i know sophie has put in the chat the link to our e email and newsletter so, so if you keep an eye on, on that that will update you um, as well on everything as well and then the next sessions will be all around fashion so if people have you know ideas different organizations about fashion do feel free to email us and and um, reach out on that one as well. But um, yeah, thank you again, Emily, um, for joining us. I love my kiwis in my box this week. <laughs> I never knew they could be that big in that shape as well. Um, so yeah, you really do also bring bring a little joy in, in tough times with, with these kind of nice, nice odd shaped or normal shaped fruit and vegetables <laughs> um, in our boxes. So thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank Thanks you. a lot. <laughs> Bye. Bye.